Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Learn with Jason. Today on the show, we have Alex Banks. Alex, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, yeah, <laughs> thank you for having me. This is really exciting to be here. Yeah, I'm I'm uh, I'm super excited to dig into this. I um, you know we'll we'll talk more about what we're going to do here in a minute. But first, I want to hear a little bit about you, if you don't mind giving us a uh, a quick backstory. Yeah, uh, I am a web developer and a teacher. And I've, I've been doing this for about 20 years. I started uh, in professional web development in 1998, actually. And uh, and the thing about web development for me, which is really funny, is I've always been trying to get out of this career. <laughs> so it's always been a job for me, a job <laughs> that I love. But um, when I started doing it, I wanted to be an actor. So I moved to Chicago and I really focused on acting. And I was able to build web, uh, a company, actually, a web development company around uh, my acting desire. And of oh, course, the cool. web development company grew and became successful. And I, I became moderately successful as a local actor. <laughs> uh, but so then, yeah, it's the same thing now when uh, we moved to Tahoe and I'm pretty much a ski bum and I've built web development and all of that other stuff around uh, around that lifestyle. So it's been really interesting and fascinating for me, but I see it now as an asset because like whenever I go out and do something else, I get a lot of creativity that I bring back to programming and back to web development. Um, so that, that's actually something I love. Like I, I've, I've had conversations with people about this in a, a, a few different um, places. And like that idea of it's like being a web developer is a, it's a great thing. It's a really fun job. There's a, there's so much that you can do there, but it's not like, it's so much more fun if you're a whole person. Like if you're if you're bringing your interests from like outside of web development, if you're exploring other parts of of being an adult, you know, of uh, of just like living a full life. Right. Like you can do so many interesting things by combining your other interests with web development. Um, like you were just telling me about uh, like when we were doing the warm up for this, you were you were just telling me about some musical stuff. You do you want to talk about that for a minute? The The DJ stuff? Oh yeah, yeah. So during COVID, one of the things that I did is uh, we have an Oculus that we didn't use very much, but I found a alpha to a program called Microdose, and it's essentially this program where you're in space and you can paint particles that move to music. Um, so during COVID, I kind of learned the Twitch thing. I learned how to stream Microdose with DJs because basically every uh, DJ took their thing to Twitch too and mm -hmm. had like streams every night. I don't know if you were a part of seeing that. Mm -hmm. um, and I was able to figure out how to do it, how to send chroma key videos and all that other stuff through that. So yeah, software relates to everything. Yeah. And like when we when we were acting in particular, it, it applies there too, because when we were doing improv, if you just went to improv shows and you just did improv and you stayed in that little, you'd had nothing to draw from. Mm -hmm. It's almost things became a copy of a copy and it gets a little bit like incestuous. But if you like got out of that circle, it gave you all of this wonderful stuff to draw from. And software is the same way, right? Because yeah. if you do one other thing, whenever you're doing that one other thing, you're always thinking, oh, like I could build an app for this. Like, wait, when are we going to have like true AR? We can, we can build shadow racing. That's what I think for skiing is like, I want to race a shadow of myself. Oh, <laughs> on the yeah. And stuff like that. <laughs> so all of those ideas, like waypoint apps and guided tours and all of those things come up just because like, I'm not in here always trying to think about interesting things to program. Um, yeah. So yeah. yeah. If part of your life is a user. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. Right. Like you, you have to have the, the real world experience to, to inform the like professional stuff, right? You can't, it's yeah. like you said, it becomes a copy of a copy. Uh, yeah. Question in the chat, uh, did Eve do improv with you? Uh, yes, that's actually how we met. <laughs> we nice. Were a, we were in an improv group together. Uh, that's um, Eve Porcello for anybody who's not familiar with who we're talking about. <laughs> Yeah, Eve is my wife and partner and co-author, um, and we do all this together. And so, yeah, when we met, we knew we could work together. We actually did a, a two-person show, like not too long after we met, maybe a year or two. Like we wrote and produced a show, and we had kind of a big name uh, Chicago improv guy as our nice. director. And it, yeah, it was a cool. blast. Yeah, so. <laughs> I, and what I love, so like I, um, I'm gonna gush about Eve a little bit because uh, she's like one of my favorite educators in the space, and. And I feel like the the improv um, has made such a you can see when somebody has improv experience as a presenter. Like I I think that the she's so like comfortable and fluid and funny and like adaptable and things can go wrong and she doesn't she like just keeps rolling and I I think like 
that is such a, a rare and, and wonderful skill. And that's, you know, I, I recommend her stuff all the time for that reason. Like she's so yeah. much fun and she's so engaging to, to watch and learn from. Um, yeah. And that's dude, the key to that. Yeah. We, we totally use all of the improv stuff for that, but one of the biggest keys is just rehearsal. Right. So like we've written shows and stuff together. Rehearsal is uncomfortable, right? Mm-hmm. You get in your living room and you're starting to act like characters and stuff. So once you get used to the fact that like, hey, do this on your feet, do this presentation on your feet as much as possible so that it becomes like a monologue, mm-hmm. then you're really comfortable. And then when stuff happens, you can kind of improvise with it because it's your monologue. You're not like, what am I doing next? It's so. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. That's very cool. Um, okay, so let's let's talk a little bit about the the tech that we're going to do today. So one of the the areas that you are an expert in is GraphQL, um, and so GraphQL is a huge discipline. It goes you know from from way in the back, uh, the kind of computer sciencey actual graph specification, all the way to the front end where it's just I'm sending off a request to a, an API, and I don't need to really know about GraphQL outside of forming a query. Um, so what? What part of that spectrum are we going to be looking at today? Yeah, we're going to be looking at the API part. Cool. So like creating, we're going to be creating schemas and then we're going to be standing up GraphQL APIs. The only difference is, is we're going to be able to stand up these GraphQL APIs as separate services and have them communicate with each other. Awesome. And I was going to talk a little bit about why, why we would do this in the first place and, and when to do this. Because, you know, when we analyze all of these wonderful tools in our arsenal. It doesn't mean we need to use every tool on every site, mm-hmm. um, but there are definite um, places where you want to consider federation, or at least think about the fact that as your application grows, you're going to be going there. Because yeah. it's really about scaling. And, <laughs> and, and so let, let's talk a little bit about what that means, right? So when you talk about federation, um, or maybe we can start by talking about what existed before, right? So, so originally you would have a REST API and you would have lots of different endpoints in that REST API. And, yeah, yeah. you know, so if you wanted to get your, your blog post, you'd have to call one endpoint, and then you would get back a list of like comment IDs and you have to call another endpoint to get the comments and mm-hmm. so on and so forth. Um, and so GraphQL makes it so that you are able to do one query that's like, I would like my posts and each comment for those posts and the author for that comment and so on and so forth. And it all comes back in one kind of like the way that you expect it, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But where this gets tricky is um, with REST APIs, you would potentially have like multiple services that you're calling from where I would say I want to get my my GitHub data uh, and then I also want to get my my custom database and then I want to pull in this other thing. Um, In GraphQL, like that, you start to get out of that model now where you're like, okay, well, I have this unified graph here, but then there's all this other stuff out elsewhere. And it doesn't really make sense to try to bring all your GitHub stuff in house, right? So, this is this was kind of like where schema stitching came from. Yep. Um, yep. And then is federate and so schema stitching for those who aren't familiar with it is when you basically create like an alias in your GraphQL that says, "Hey, if if somebody makes this query, send it somewhere else, like send it to GitHub, and then bring it back as if it was coming from this API or from this yep. GraphQL server." Um, so is is federation another way of saying schema stitching or like where what's yeah, the conceptual another technique difference for all of that and realistically so the architecture for all of this it's not just graphql it predates mm-hmm. graphql it's mm-hmm. like the microservice architecture and it's kind of like we really need to embrace this because it's really how you know if we're working at a large company you have to do this like yeah. you have services all over the company that you're using um but if you're even working for yourself it's like using things like auth zero even or stripe you're you're working with this architecture yeah. where you're putting the need to do that functionality on a completely different team on a completely different company and so on and so forth so it's really an architectural principle that's happening in all of our applications federation is just a solution to make it work really easily with graphql so wow. that as you write your schema and stuff, everything's going to plug together really nicely. But what we're doing is microservices. And what Federation really is, is it's like an API orchestration layer. So if you're familiar with orchestration layers, they essentially juggle and grab all of the information from those underlying services and send them all up through one endpoint. So as you make a request for a page, whether you're using REST or TCP or whatever you're using, this concept of orchestrating several services behind one layer has always been there. And GraphQL is all about one layer. So it just makes sense. If you build these services in GraphQL, they will automatically fit together. 
Yeah. So if you build this using Apollo Federation, they'll automatically fit together. But don't worry, because if you have an, a REST API that you don't have as a GraphQL API yet, one of the neat things about GraphQL is you can easily just make REST calls to that API and still grab the data in and send it out uh, with GraphQL. So all of this stuff that we're going to learn today, everything we're going to look at can be adopted incrementally. Mm -hmm. You can use uh, REST APIs right beside GraphQL APIs. But moving forward, if you really embrace GraphQL, you will easily be able uh, to orchestrate your microservices. I'm into it. I, let's let's dive right in, right? I think this all is right. going to be awesome. So I'm going to uh, switch over to the other view here. Let's get into coding view. So I got a couple nope. of drawings. Let me see. Here's the Twitch chat. Um, and real quick, while you're looking for those, I'm going to do a shout out. We uh, have live captioning on the show today by White Coat Captioning. And thank you very much for making this show more accessible. The live captioning is uh, made possible by sponsorships from Netlify, Fauna, Sanity, and Auth0. Um, and just it's so great that uh, that so many companies are willing to kick in and make make a live stream more accessible to the, the broader community. Uh, so thank you very much. You can watch, you can see these captions at lwj.dev slash live. Um, all right. And so then, did you have a, a link for me? Yeah, I just dropped it. Hold on, let me put it. I'm going to put it in the chat. So I have okay. some drawings. Um, I watched your show the other week and I was like, ooh, maybe I could draw these live. <laughs> and then we were like, oh, no, don't do that. We only have an hour. So <laughs> um, I have a couple drawings I want to show just so we can take a step back for people who might not necessarily understand why, uh, what the microservice architecture is or like mm -hmm. why we have it or what the point of it is. Um, I just want to talk about scaling. So realistically, the point of all this is scaling. Is growing. It doesn't mean it's growing your user base and your application, it's growing your code base, or it could just mean growing your clients, growing your company. So if you are growing, it's time to start thinking about scaling. And we think about scaling um, <clears throat> with the representation of a cube. So we would assume that down here, right down here in this lower left-hand corner of the cube, what we represent with that is a monolithic application, meaning that you have one code base that everybody works on. This application is running out of one instance that everybody hits, basically the first applications we've all built, right? <laughs> so uh, it's just one thing running out of one instance. So as we go to the other end of the scale cube. Uh, do I next? Oh, no, I got, I got it. I got you. Oh. Uh, so as we, as we go to the other end of the scale cube, the way we actually scale is by breaking that one thing up into many different pieces and many different parts. So this means instances, putting some of the code someplace, using uh, third-party services, and so on. So every application falls somewhere within this continuum of being an absolute monolith to a totally distributed microservice uh, architecture. And you don't have to be at one, you know, when you start, you're going to be moving from from moving your monolith into a distributed scaled application. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to have it all right away. It's not one or the other. You're somewhere on this cube. So the horizontal axis of this cube means instances. So the first way that I can easily scale my application is just to spin up more instances of that application. So that's like, okay, well, I have a lot of people using this app. Let's go ahead and run it on some other processors or run it on some other computers and then put a load balancer in there and let people hit it. The second um, line on this cube, our uh, y-axis there, is microservices. So what that means is we can break the application up by functionality. So you can think of like something like Auth0. They will take care of all of your user and account-based in, uh, interaction, storing that data, uh, authorizing users and all of that for you so that you can build other parts of your app. That's a that's a pretty good example of one of those. And then the z-axis is what we call partitioning. And this is typically more about database stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, this means that like, okay, our database is getting really overloaded. So maybe we start to break it up by region or we break it up by uh, records from A through Z over here or A through M over here and N through Z over here or so on and so forth. So those are the three directions that you can move on the scale cube um, as you scale your application. So instances on our x-axis, microservices on our y-axis, and partitioning, data partitioning on our z-axis. So we scale instances by cloning. And these are the drawings that I have for you. And I, I drew, I'm into I drew it. these drawings. I did not get Maggie to draw them. <laughs> <laughs> My heart. <laughs> so let's consider this. You have an advice booth, right? 
and you're giving advice to people. So people coming up to you and they're asking you all sorts of questions, right? So you're realizing, oh, wow, I have a lot of people asking advice and it's time to grow my advice group. So if you're going to grow your advice group by instances, you're going to get some other buddies who are really good at giving advice and you're going to open up two or three more windows that can handle all of the crowd. So now everybody's lining up behind their own little advice window. We see this type of scaling at the grocery store all the time, right? Like, can we get this aisle open so that we can handle all of this traffic that we uh, have here? So that's what we think about when we think about cloning or scaling horizontally. Those are instances, right? So we just get more of the same thing. And our instances, right, you can run, you can do this like right on your computer. You can run multiple instances behind a load balancer locally in your development environment on your computer. That's where like we just run things on different ports. And that's what we're going to be doing today. Like port 4000 and 5000 and 4001. Sure. They're all separate instances that are going to be running locally on our computer. And then the whole thing about that is we can run them across computers. We can run them on the cloud. You can really scale out your instances as your application becomes popular. And then once you're global, this is really what you're going for, is actually having instances on the edge. So in data centers, you actually have instances of your advice booth running everywhere so people can get that information locally without having to send those requests around the world. So that's pretty common, horizontal scaling. But what... Um, what we're going to be talking about is scaling our scaling microservices. Mm -hmm. But real quick, I do want to go over the partitioning because I want you to think about uh, what that Z axis actually means. So consider like, again, we have another booth and here you are, you have records. Now we're going to go over here and we're going to get our account information or something like that. Um, but once we actually have a lot of people who need records, one booth is going to slow everything down for us. So we could obviously create, uh, horizontal scaling and just open up other record booths, but there's kind of a better way. We can actually open up other record booths by some sort of partition. Mm -hmm. So now we're saying, hey, if your last name begins with A through K, go ahead and line up at this first booth, L through P at the second, and then Q through Z at the third. So now we've applied more booths and we're able to handle more of a crowd, but it's not necessarily like each booth does the exact same thing. Yeah. So from a data standpoint, each of these booths have different records, right? and different requests. So that's our um, horizontal partitioning, or it's also referred to as sharding. And like, if you're coming from the database standpoint, you've heard of all of this, right? Because databases like Mongo, they all have tools to support um, horizontal partitioning, sharding, and all of that stuff. Well, I, I think like in the stuff that you're describing is, is I think a lot of the reason why people are starting to migrate toward stuff like GraphQL or like the Jamstack architecture, the idea of putting things on like CDNs and stuff, because that, that abstracts away so much of this. Like, uh, you know, I've I have been building stuff for the, the last couple of years on a, a kind of a CDN architecture specifically because it means I haven't had to think about multiple instances or getting things globally distributed. That's all happening in the background with the services that I that I use. You know, that's like kind of Netlify's whole deal, right? Is like, oh, to put this up here yeah. and it's going to show up everywhere around the world and it, and it, just, it just works. You never have to think about scale. Yeah. Um, and so what I, what I think we're about to talk about is what I'm excited about. Is it sounds like you're about to tell us how to do this for data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So here's the other thing about that. You're absolutely right. And one of the reasons we're doing that is because every large tech company has done that to mm -hmm. handle the traffic and everything and to handle like just massive amounts of traffic. So um, I really got deep into all of this. We actually used to teach at Yahoo. We used to help onboard their engineers. Mm -hmm. And it was the first place that I went that had a service and a team for everything. And, you know, we were kind of teaching people how to touch those tools and, and do stuff with, with those tools. What's been really neat that I've seen since then is this explosion of all the tools for us, for everybody to use. Not that they're just behind the wall at this company, because people have been doing this for quite a while. But now mm -hmm. we do have Netlify. We do have Auth0. We do have Stripe. So we're working in this environment Anyways, and yeah. this is like, so it's nothing new. We're just going to learn how to do this with GraphQL. And like the, what we're going to actually do, the, the federation part is really about microservices. And that's the Y axis on our scale cube. So now let's consider our advice booth again, right? We have this advice booth and we have a lot of people. We have too many people to give all the advice to at once, lines around the block. So another way that we could scale this advice booth is by specialty. So maybe you have somebody who specializes in financial advice. Maybe you have a booth that specializes in love advice. And maybe you have a booth that specializes in wellness advice. Now, the key to this type of positioning is, one, you don't have to hire an employee that knows everything. 
and mm-hmm. that can give an advice about everything. So now you're hiring experts in finance and love and wellness. So you're actually giving better advice and you're handling the crowd. But as we can see, we also have a lot of people who want love advice, right? So wellness, a couple of people, finance, a couple of people, but love, that's what everybody wants to know about. Well, all of these things work together. So that means I can horizontally partition this app as well. So what we've done is we've broken it up into microservices, but because love is the biggest booth that we have, I've horizontally partitioned that and split that up into separate instances. So now we have three love booths and they're all giving advice. They can handle the love crowd and it allows you to really focus on these things like booth by booth, if you Mm -hmm. really want to think about it. So when we do things along this Y axis or when we're scaling along the microservices axis, we're breaking up all of our applications into special functionality. It's kind of like specialization of labor (laughs) for our our application. This is how all civilization exploded once this concept (laughs) came in. Um, I didn't realize we were getting like this is this is going deep. We're getting into like the secret of human like human success on this planet. (laughs) It was microservices all along. Oh yeah. So this is really exciting stuff. And then again, like I said, you know, you can decompose your applications. Like we have booths specialized for finance, uh, love and wellness. And then if any of those booths are big, you then treat them like they're little applications. Mm-hmm. So you can then each of these services, the whole point is, is they have their own tools. You can build every service out of your own language. You can use whatever database you want. The whole real reason that we do this is because it's not just about scaling the applications. Mm-hmm. It's about scaling the company right? If we're all touching the same code base, it's a, that's a nightmare. You know, mm-hmm. we're all going to constantly be afraid of breaking something that somebody else did. And we also, that's too much to put in your head. So when you actually have like a company, like look at this monolith here, we have a front end and an admin portal. And then we have, you know, information about shows and then theaters that those shows are in. I guess it's a movie theater thing or a ticket thing where we can search for shows or concerts and then check out and customers. Now the developers, DBAs and the backends, they all work on this code base. Mm -hmm. You better believe that that's slow and that, and also the quality goes down unless there's a lot of checks and balances and hoops uh, through the production process, which actually makes it slower. So the real reason that we actually do this is so that we can break our organizations up into smaller teams that are focused on one product. Mm -hmm. Because if I have a team of DBAs and I put them with a team of front end developers um, and back end developers, that small team can work together to build a full application that handles part of the system. And then you have a beautiful show catalog. And then you have these people over here working on theaters. And what this really allows us to do even is put all these people in separate buildings, Mm -hmm. right? And if we're doing this right, none of these people need to talk to each other. Like if you really want to go there, you know, that's the goal. Doesn't always happen. (laughs) Well, and and this is actually, so this is, uh, when when I was at IBM, this is, kind of the migration that we were in the process of, right? Is when I, before I joined, they had 1 million line Java monolith and it was, you know, it was this big old beast and it was really hard to maintain because like you said, people would try to touch something and it would break. And then they would try to touch something else and they would break somebody else's code and not even realize it. Um, And so they, they went the microservices route, which in like, like, and, and to, to talk about the, the incremental adoption that you can do here, they didn't do microservices by like rebuilding everything as microservices. They spun up 35 parallel instances of the monolith and gave each one to a team and said, look, do whatever you want with this. You can't break other people's code. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, and yeah, then yeah. over time, they chipped away the pieces they didn't need to get down to just the microservice they actually owned. And the the quality of that code tremendously increased because you didn't, nobody can have context on a million lines of code. Yeah. But you can absolutely have context on the one little corner of it that's yours. Yes. Um, and so, yeah, it's it's a it was a huge difference. And and a, a, I think like and like these teams are spread across China, across like IBM has offices in like over like several dozen countries. Right. So like people were all over the place and we talked to some teams, the ones that we work with frequently, but like other teams, they just existed and we knew they were there, but we never had to go back and forth. We couldn't break their stuff. We couldn't take them down. We just kind of like worked on our initiatives and everything was cool. Yeah. 
exactly. And then you just get to focus on that. And, you know, like an ex example, again, you know, I've been saying like Alt Zero and Stripe and stuff a lot. Those are examples of this working successfully. Yeah. Because you can't call up a Stripe developer and be like, I want you to change it to work like this. I mean, you can make a feature request and stuff and they'll consider it. But at the same time, like you're, you're getting your information through documentation. Yeah. And that's why GraphQL is great for this because GraphQL is like documentation for your API. So what we're going to do is we're going to implement this structure. And then here's another screen where maybe um, mm. instead of having a team work on checkout and having a team work on authorization, we just uh, use services, third party services for that. And now with the number of developers we have, we can break them up into three. Teams. So it's all about scaling your applications. It's about scaling your organization too. And you know, the, the third part that I like to think about with this is scaling your clients. Yeah. So Right. If you're sitting back and you're a web developer and you just develop websites for mm -hmm. people, like you just crank them out. That's what I used to do when I met Eve when we were doing theater and stuff. It was just like new client. Here's another proposal. Here's another website. And then a lot of the stuff you're doing, like very similar code. So once you get a, a good boilerplate, you're just reusing that boilerplate of code. Mm -hmm. Now, I would be watching this and I'd think, hey, I'm not. Um, a big company. I don't really have a lot of developers. This federation stuff isn't for me, but I want to say it absolutely is because if you're growing your clients, one of the things you're going to notice is you're doing the same thing over and over again. Like, like I cannot tell you how many times I have built a login form yeah. and like authorization and like create account in so many different languages through the years and like how it's always been sort of a struggle. Yeah. When we started doing OAuth, I was like really shocked because I had been a web developer for a long time. And it was like, why? Like, this is hard. And you have to learn to do this over and over and over again. So if you're running one of these organizations, you're like, okay, I'll just copy and paste all of my auth and we'll just keep copying and pasting it, right? But you can build your own account service. And if you build your own account service, you can have all of the users for all of the applications that you use in one place, which ultimately gives you more control. But it also means you don't have to build the account service for every single one of your new clients. You already have the ability for them to log in and create accounts and all of that that you can just plug into your GraphQL API. So that's what I want to do today. Yes. I want to show you how to build an account service, something like a smaller, more educational version of auth zero <laughs> <laughs> i'm gonna start no, i'm stealing that <laughs> phrase a more educational version which you can read to mean probably only mostly works <laughs> yeah we're, we're not handling errors is what that means it's like <laughs> riddled with error. errors pretty much as far as we're gonna go <laughs> good 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 i'm into it um, um yeah and so that that's what we're doing and i think we might as well just jump into this and get started so yes. what i want you to do is start up and build a new apollo server and you can do this anywhere you like uh you can create files locally yes i will let you know i've only done this locally but um i think it works in code sandbox and stuff like that too if you wanted to give it a shot there um but I also have, I'm going to have a local repository for us to download that has all of the demonstration of this. And that's what we're going to plug into. So I already have an account service. And what we want to do is plug your application into the account service. Got it. Okay. So what we're looking to build right now, and we can get ideas from chat and whatnot. We need a small application that would like mimic something that users could add posts. So that could be like, a dictionary application where I can post a term and a definition, or maybe um, just a note application where we post a note and a date, or maybe it's just as simple as like two words. What I use for this and what we use for this in our new book, I'm gonna plug a book here, Learning React, we use a uh, color organizer. And I already have that application that we're gonna use as a demonstration, but we just basically, when we design uh, stuff to teach, we're not looking for a lot of fields, right? right. Because every time we wanna post something, we don't wanna have to fill out 10 different fields to make it work. Right. So we only wanna post one or two fields, like a, like a definition or a color or something like that. Okay, um, I think we should just do like, let's just do free association. So we'll okay. put a yeah. word in and then we'll decide what the next word is that we think of. And maybe the chat can help. Uh, yeah, so yeah, we'll yeah. pick a word and then the chat can free associate. <laughs> That's perfect. Remember I'll chat, this is a PG-13 <laughs> show. Um, so I'm gonna get in it and then let's open this thing up. Yeah, and let's start with the schema. Let's see what type of schema. And when I say CRUD, like really all we need is a CR. To make this okay. work for today's, like all we need to be able to do is create a word or a word combo or something like that. And then like I'll query all of them. 
so okay. that we can see what all the words are. And then maybe even query an individual one. And then what we want to think about these words as being is like full on posts. They could be like images or like tweets or something like that, but we're just keeping the data set small so we can get this thing done. Okay. So um, we will say like word will be a string and uh -huh. association will be a string. And I think that's probably enough. So and then give it an ID just for the fun of it, just for the fun of it, give it an ID, good maybe call. two. Um, because I don't know if we're going to make it this far, but if we can actually uh, let other services associate with this, it would need an ID or a unique mm -hmm. identifier. Uh, so we would probably want like a get all, and that would bring us back a free association. Perfect. If I can spell it right, I should copy paste this so that I don't have to keep trying to do that. Yeah. Maybe um, I'll look up for one, maybe one of them. I don't know. Yeah. I don't want to do too much. No, let's not do it. Let's not do too no. much. No, just, just yeah, the, just the all. all. Yeah, and I get excited need... about doing too much and then we don't make it as far as we could. So <laughs> do add. Yes. Or we'll just do add free association. And that is going to be a, uh, something like this. And then yeah. we need an input of input. And that's just going to be the word. Do you want it? So, okay, actually, I have a question for you because you've done more schema design than me. Um, also, I just realized I'm like going through this and not explaining what I'm doing. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so maybe we do first things first. Let's talk through what we're actually accomplishing here. Yeah. Um, so the, the first thing is we've defined two built-in GraphQL types, queries and mutations. Um, a query is like a read operation. And a mutation is anything else. Um, and so what we're doing here would be the create. Um, mm -hmm. We could also do an update. We could also do a delete if we wanted. Those would both be mutations. Yeah. Um, then I've defined a type. And this is like a if you were defining a database table, um, it's just a little more what I consider to be human friendly. We're saying this is what it's called. This is what it has. And this is the data type that goes in it. Um, these exclamation points mean that it's required. So like no empty fields, basically. Um, and then for a mutation, we're saying that we're, whenever someone calls this mutation, we're going to say, I want to add a free association. I have to provide this data. No, I did that wrong. Didn't I? Yeah. So you want that's, that goes into the arguments if you're going to do it there. So the add free association, you can return the free association from that. Or like, you know, we like if we were doing our, our good job work, we'd create a mutation type and all that, but it doesn't really matter. One of the things I like to return on mutations just real easy and quick is booleans, you know? <laughs> so it's like cool. old school, like return true. At the yeah, end yeah. Of the it so, doesn't really matter. It just means that it worked. Like, So here's my question, right? So um, so what we're doing is we're we're going to have the mutation type where we, we add an argument. So the, And this is going to get called like a function, uh, basically. Yeah. We add a free association and then we have to provide these values. So when you're designing your inputs, I've seen this done a few ways. Is it better to do like an inputs field uh -huh. with something like this? Or do you prefer to have like, you know, word associate, like, do you put the stuff straight in? What's your- yeah, so that's, that's actually what I do. So what I do is I try to keep things as simple as possible. What that means is if there's only one or two arguments, I would just put them right in there. Right. Because look, you just deleted a bunch of lines of code to be able to do that. Now, as soon as you get to that third argument, that becomes difficult. Yeah. So then I go ahead and put them inside of the input fields. But the design process is one of like always growing. Um, just a neat little side note with input types. They're actually your forms. They usually look like your forms that you have mm -hmm. on the. So you can create um, something that reads input types and automatically generates forms. So sometimes you can think of an input type as being like, okay, well, what does this form mean? And what am I going to see on this screen? And you can kind of group your stuff like that once you get to the UI level. But that's when I'm starting like this and we're just messing around, I do exactly what you've done there because there's only two arguments and it's kind of easy to put them in there. Um, so I always prioritize simplicity. Like that's my goal, right? Like if we don't need the other type, if we don't need the other thing right away, I try not to use it. And mm. I know we're going there. Code is constantly going to change. You know, there'll be, there'll be a day where we come in here and we're deleting those arguments. Yeah. <laughs> and we're, we're adding the type, but like, this is how we're going to get it started for now. Cool. And Perfect. One, one, 
one other key that I want to add is like, yeah, if you haven't really seen much of much GraphQL, this is why I love this. Look, we haven't built an app at all yet, but we're defining what we're going to build right here. So it gives like, right, we have a way that we could talk about this and decide where to put the arguments. And you can talk with like your whole team about this stuff mm -hmm. before anybody ever sits down to code the application. Well, and I think that's what's really fascinating about using GraphQL. And like, and when you say whole team, it's not just developers. We could put this up in front of a team of executives and say like, look, this is the data we're collecting. What exactly. do you, do we need additional data here? And that's exactly. really powerful because it's really difficult to do if you're showing somebody like a JavaScript object. Yeah. And people like sometimes developers, they want to take all of their stuff and they don't want to show necessarily the product owners or, or the project managers because they assume like we know about the tech stuff, right? But at the same time, this is a level that you can communicate with everybody. You can mm -hmm. communicate with your stakeholders, your owners. And as a developer, I honestly would rather have my product manager know exactly what I'm going to build. Yeah. So there's no confusion about like, you told me to build this and return these exact types. We went, you know, like this is what this is all about. So I love graphics. QL for I, this. It, it, yeah. And I mean, we'll, we'll look at it in a little bit here, but like the, the really exciting thing about defining types like this and like having these, these strong uh, configurations here is like, we're going to get things like auto completion. We're going to be able to automatically document our code and like automatically validate code. All these things that are, they're not impossible to do with a REST API or like other API specs, but you have to add extra stuff. You need to actually implement the open API spec and like validate it and make sure that your docs are up to date. Whereas with this, you can't ship an out of date documentation for a schema because the schema is the code. It's like you're, you're writing your docs and your code in the same place. And that's like the power of that is really difficult to overstate. Yeah. Well, I mean, the thing is, I've, I've had a lot of people be like, I don't like GraphQL. And what do you think of ODATA and all that other stuff? And there's no point to GraphQL. And then I'll look at them and I'll say, do you like type systems? <laughs> and they'll be like, I love TypeScript and all this other stuff. And I'm like, GraphQL is a type system for your API. And then yep. you see the light bulbs go off. And it's like, <laughs> oh, wait, I like type systems. I don't like GraphQL. I like type systems. I don't like so. <laughs> Very fun. <laughs> Cycle to get through. <clears throat> All right, let's make this thing work. Let's do it. Okay, you might have to talk me through this part because it's been a while since I've built a okay. server. Yeah, so let me, you know, I have to pull one up so I can look at it. Because, <laughs> you know, me too. Um, so what we're going to do is that we're going to create like just basically, you could do all of this in one JavaScript file. So okay. we can create like an index.js or something like that. If you want to do the installs first, you can install GraphQL and Apollo server. Okay, and then in here, I need to import, is GraphQL a named import? Um, no, I just import it as text usually. So I actually usually read it. I think they probably have some good um, Webpack tools that we could put in play, but we don't really have any right now. Okay. We want to avoid doing that. So yeah. And then I need, um, is it, is it, it's a default export, right? Apollo server? Yes, I think so. Let me look. Let me actually, I didn't pull that up. Let me get me a little cheat sheet here. Um, so I don't think this has changed, but what I've always had to do with my type defs, unless I put a Webpack tool in and I hadn't, I still haven't found one that I love for importing that GraphQL. I have to actually do a file system read file. Oh, yeah. So like you want to import the file system and then you just do a SF read file sync and pull it in as text because it's just a text file. Right. And uh, the last time I was messing around it, with one of the importers, it just doesn't do everything I wanted it to do. Is it and like, I was like this? Huh? Yeah, exactly. Read file sync and then import that. There you go. Oh, wait, I'm in node. Yeah. Out here writing. Yeah, and you want to grab, okay, too so long I'm now. sorry, it's been a while, the Apollo server, you want to destructure that and also grab GQL. Oops. Oh, you know, just Apollo server, you don't need the GQL because we actually put the types in a separate file. Got I'm it, sorry about okay. That. We're going to use that for that. So there you go, you got your type devs, you got your Apollo server, so now you're going to need resolvers and you can just create them here. Okay. So just create an object called resolvers. And let's see, for this one, we need to do 
query like, and mutation. So, right, go show everybody the uh, schema real quick. This is yeah. a real fun part. Let me pull these side by side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what we're gonna do in the resolvers object is just match what we created in the schema. So we have a type query, we're gonna use that. We have a type mutation, we're gonna use that. Eventually, you'd probably even have a free association type listed in your schema. We don't need that just yet um, because we're not doing any custom fields off of that. But one really important thing to notice if this is your first time ever seeing GraphQL is that the schema definition defines what we're gonna build and the resolvers are where you actually do the work. So you'll notice that these things look alike. They're like mirrors. Mm -hmm. And all resolvers are, are their functions, right? That return data that matches the type that you define. So this is what I really love about GraphQL and I love telling students this. They're all like, well, can I load data from here and here and here? I'm like, it's a function, whatever you could do in a function. You know, like in a function, I can get data from a, a Twitch stream and a database and the weather and juggle all of those things to return whatever I want. So yeah, so yeah that's the beautiful thing about it. <laughs> well, and this, this is actually really exciting too because that, that, what that means is that we can do something like this where we do like, ID one, and then we do word. Yeah. And then association. Right. And like, yeah, yeah, yeah. this works now. Like once yeah, we, once we plug it in, this will actually return data for us. Yeah. 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 So maybe actually, maybe we should do that. Um, well, what I want you to do though, is we're going to change it though. So we're going to okay. add to that. So we do want to put that in a variable. Um, we can just do it locally, like a local variable, but since we're going to modify that array. Oh, I get what you mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Free association, we need a place that we can add that. So right there will work. <laughs> yeah, and you can put that, yeah, perfect, beautiful. Okay. So see that, that's crazy. We're just returning that array. Mm -hmm. And get all free association, if you look on line two of the schema, it says, oh, we're gonna get like an array or a list of free association types. Yep. So that's how all of that matches up. And then like notice here too, this is a JavaScript object that has an ID, a word, and an association, an ID, a word, and an association. This is uh -huh. an ID. And like an ID just means anything unique too. So like this yeah. could also be like ABC123 or whatever. Um, but then for the word, we know it's gonna be a string. Association is gonna be a string. So like we can kind of, like I didn't have to know things. I was able to just look at this and say, oh yeah, I need an ID, a word, and an association. And then I know what types to return for that, which is, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't do that if you tell me what a REST API is. Like if you're like, oh yeah, go hit the the user's endpoint. I'm like, okay, well, what's there? Whereas with this, I'm like, I know exactly what's here. Yeah. And when you document it and explain it with notes too, you even know more about what's there. <laughs> this okay. is sweet. So should we spin this up and test that? Or do you want to go ahead and build the push too? No, no, let's, let's spin it up and then we'll add a push. All right, that sounds good. So what we need to do is you're gonna create a new service instance, a new server instance using Apollo server. New. And you wanna put this, I usually put this in some sort of a, a start. I usually put make it a start asynchronous function. Okay. And then call that. Yeah. There you go. So this will start the application, right? Okay. And we're gonna create a new server. And then we send that server in an object, the type diffs and the resolvers. Is that all? That's all. And then okay. on the next line, you want to do a server dot listen. This I feel like this got way easier than I remember. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. Where do you where do you see federation? Because it's like we're gonna add two lines to this. And I'm so ding, excited. Done, so. <laughs> okay, so so uh, now I just pick any port, right? Yeah. So let's see. We're using a lot of. We're gonna be using a lot of ports. I'm gonna have you start something that has a lot of ports. So let's pick port. Um, 4003. That's okay. Okay. And there's a naming convention to these. Ports. So we're going to start it on that port. And then I usually do a dot then because that's a promise, or you could do an await for that too, if you want it. Um, but then just log. That's a promise. So I got you. you. I understand what's going on. Await it. You can, but you can, I like, I like venables. I like the yeah. dot then thing. We, <laughs> and then you can get the URL. You can destructure the URL from the argument sent to that denable, denable, and you have to destructure it. Okay. And then you can use that to just log to the console that the server is started and listening. Okay, so 34 lines of code plus 13 lines of schema. Have we built a server? Let's find out. Oh, I need to call start. 
Oh yeah, good, good. Okay. Um, all right, so let's call start and we'll see if this works. Uh, I'm going to do that by running node index. I missed a thing. Defined in resolvers, but not in schema. Uh, let's see, mutation. Let's go look at the schema and the resolvers. Add free associate. Oh, my bad. Association, see, yeah. But we know that's fast. A, that's type <laughs> system stuff right there, yeah. <laughs> it's not, it wasn't named right. Sweet, so now you have a GraphQL server. I hope, I hope people are watching this that have never seen GraphQL before so they can see how quickly we can stand up something silly. What's going on? Did this just... There we go. All right. So here's All our right. GraphQL playground. And now this is where I think things get really exciting because check this out. We are already here. And so we know like, all right, let, I'm going to just like get all free associations. Okay. Nope. That's not quite right. What happens next? So I can like go in here and if I hit, this is a thing you just have to know, but if I hit control space, it auto completes for me. Dang, look at that. There we go. Yeah. Now we've, and you can that's select a, just what you want too. That's like a data. Really to be, yeah. <laughs> and we, yeah, we don't need this ID, right? So boom, no more ID. Yep. That is incredible. Um, but it's even more exciting because look, we got buttons. So here's a schema. This is just like straight up, there's our schema. And that's cool. But this is cooler. Like we know what we can do and then we can click into it and it's going to show us what we get. And it describes like what a string is. That's yeah. amazing. And what I do, what I always tell everybody to do is you can actually comment those fields. I don't want you to do them now because some funny things happen with Federation with that sometimes. Okay. But you can actually write comments on these fields so that you can define them. You can say that the word is the word that we are going to associate and users add it or all that other stuff. Um, and you can even put emojis in there, which is fun. And when you float over everything inside of the playground, you'll see those definitions come up if you've created them. You know, So right there, it just says string. But if you actually put the, a description in there, it would pop up. So you could say, oh, that's what that is. And you can really quickly read it. So it's all about communication, like what this API can do, what the types are. Yeah, really, really cool stuff. Um, all right. Let's go ahead and add that post. Let's add the mutation. Yes, let's do it. All right. So in here, I have this ad free association. And so we decided this is going to get a word and an association. So I know that that's what's going to come in. And then I just need to data dot. Well, I think that might be the second argument. Hang on, it's been a while since I've done one of these. Oh, right, because it's going to send in like the I think root. it's the second argument, yeah, because the root is the first argument. Yeah. So the, the root is like kind of a like a vestigial field. Like, I, does anybody use the root? I've never seen it used. Yeah, there's a lot of fun stuff you can do with the root. And like, let's push that to the end of this because I think we have to use it for our stuff. So the root okay. is something that I want to explain or talk about, like maybe once we just get past this, because there's no, it's all hypothetical now and it's easier to see it when you see it. <laughs> Got <laughs> you it. Know? Okay. Um, so we're going to concatenate. Uh, we'll do the ID. I guess we can just do like a data dot length. We started yeah, at yeah, perfect. Yeah, yeah. Or no, we started at one, so we'll need to do like a plus one. Um, and then we'll do the word and the association. That's perfect. All right. And then because that worked, we're gonna return true. Um because it expects a Boolean. And let's talk about this. Usually, like when I code, this is how I start right? Because this is education friendly right now, meaning that what we would actually do typically in the real world is we would return a type um, that let us know how the mutation went, mm -hmm. whether it was successful or not, and maybe also some information that you can query about what you just added. But for our quick, you can do whatever you want with GraphQL. And when I start building things, I just put, go ahead and put in the Boolean and think about that layer later. So yeah, so we, like we could do something like we could pull this out into a like, Um, yeah. And then we would just need to send in like the word and the association again. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, you can do that and have your business logic and a whole separate thing that you just tie that to the resolvers. And then we could just like return uh, add free association. And then I would need to make this. I can make these async, right? Yep. OK, so now what we've got is um, we're, we're effectively like we've created a mutation. We have the business logic here, and it runs asynchronously. So at this point, we could like, you know. But here's the beautiful thing. This, and this is what I say. We don't need this to run asynchronously now, right? Well, wouldn't it? I, I guess I was thinking like if if the the end of the story is this ends up being like a call to a database or something. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Oh, yeah, 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 absolutely. Cool. And I get that. So like what I'm the only thing I'm saying is, is I don't do it till I need it. And you don't need that, to like fair. change your code or anything now. Fair I'm enough. just letting the users know like like you don't have to take these steps to like do things until you need to take them. Um, just yeah. because we're not doing anything asynchronously yet. But that still works. You have it set up so that that will work for that. So let's try it out, though, and make sure that we're actually getting what. OK, so I have my mutation. Um, does this hot reload? No. Start it no. again? Yeah. You can start it using NodeMon or something like that, too, and that will. OK, so, so now I'm going to just, uh, to keep this available, I'm going to create a new I'd love to tab. run the query once, just to like make sure that something else hasn't happened. All good. Okay, good. So our query works, yeah. So now I'm going to create a mutation, and it's going to auto-populate for me. Um, and it wants a word. So I'm going to choose the word Corgi. Uh, chat, free associate. First word that comes into your head with Corgi. <laughs> Party, done. Um, OK, and that's going to give us back a Boolean. So we can run it. And we get back true. Yeah, and then now, run the query again. Uh-oh. I think hmm. I might be bad at JavaScript. Oh, do what you have I... to say data equals data concat? Do you have to overwrite it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, oh, that's yeah, correct. Yeah. Okay, yep. Um, so we need to do data equals, which means we need to make this overridable. Okay, let's stop and start that. Try again. Okay. That works. Yay! Running this. Hit play. There it See? is. Okay. Yay! It works. <laughs> we did it. All right. We can do and we let's can do one more just for fun. Um, so let's do uh, skis. Free associate chat. Oh, you Run. want me to free associate? Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, no. I, I, oh yeah. <laughs> chat's got us. They got us. They got oh, us good. covered. I got us. Oh, sweet. Great. There we go. All right. So we've now built a full, like, look at that functional GraphQL API. Uh, yep. You know, the 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 next steps would be to hook that data up, which is a little bit of a draw the rest of the owl scenario. But like, we've got uh, there are other show episodes of this show on how to do data. Uh, there are tons and tons of resources on how to hook up data to a GraphQL API. Uh, I imagine that you and Eve awesome. have lots of that as well. Yeah. Yeah. The rest is just JavaScript. So it's like, what you know, get good at JavaScript, get good at Node.js, get good at database that you're working with because all the code that you typically use to do that is the same. The GraphQL is just the structure around what's getting returned. Mm -hmm. what's not. Yeah, let's, let's exactly. Sorry about that. <laughs> let's head back over to that schema because, right, the inevitable next step is to say, well, wait a second. You can't just randomly post stuff. You know, we're not like recreating Reddit here or something like that. <laughs> we want to know who is doing this association. So you would come into here and you say, okay, well, now we probably need to add stuff for authorization. So specifically, we would add like, um, I don't know, a type or add to the mutation. Well, specifically, we'd add to the mutation. Uh, we'd add user, like a type for user. I'm sorry. A type. Okay. Then, so type for user yeah, yeah you were there and it just took me a second i was thinking two steps behind you so type for user you know where they'd have like an email address and an id i, I like to use emails as ids for users on the smaller things that i do because emails are unique and an id is a unique string and it just makes sure that everything's nice and unique and then maybe they have a name and an avatar and all that other stuff so we have a we have this idea that someone's adding the free association mm -hmm. and we want to save data about them too so that means that we need to also under the mutations we would add a create account 
and like a login or an authorize. Um, and so with this one, we would want like, like email password probably. And then the create like, oh, pro this one would probably have so many fields that you would make it an input because you'd want the name, you know, the user's name and, um, and do you do know. it like this or do you, you do it like this? I, I actually haven't. I specifically call them forms because I have them so linked to forms in my head. <laughs> so like this? No, that's my, oh no, I call it input, but my naming convention isn't input. It's always form, like the user form. So I'm like thinking about it already. Like, oh, these are my screens. And I kind of, cause this like, how do you break those things up? What do you, how do you break your user inputs up and decide that maybe this, these should go in this input type and these should go in this input type. What I do is I visually say, okay, we have these wireframes. So each of these screens are just an input type that we're using typically. It, and that's no, just me. I don't know if. How do you, how do, so we're not going to keep the password in the, Schema. So you input it as a string, right? It, when it comes over, you don't, it's not a password when it comes over. Hopefully you have HTTPS set up and everything mm -hmm. that you're sending is encrypted. We're not ever going to, we don't put password on the user type so that you could query it. <laughs> you know, we'll never, this, these input types are just for the data that you're sending. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we send our passwords. I don't think, and I mean, if you wanted to, you could go an extra edge and like encrypt the password on your JavaScript side and then decrypt it when it gets to the server. Sure. But that's, I mean, that's what HTTPS is for. Right, you know, right, so. right. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, so let's not do that though, right? Because if we do this, then we have to do this every single time we get a new client. And this client wants free association, right? But what if somebody wants something that does images, like just a photo sharing thing or somebody that wants, we still want users and we still want them to log in. So what we should do, Jason, is we should build a federated account service for all of the stuff that we're going to build. Yes, and then please. we'll just federate that into our graphs. Excellent. That's what we're here for. Yes. So in order to do this, what I want you to do, I'll put this link in here. We're going to go to something that I call the moon highway cloud. Okay. So I'll go ahead and throw this link in side of the chat and it's a GitHub repository. And it's like, it's a little like the under construction Death Star. It's it's fully operational. You can use this to destroy a planet, but it's still under construction. So there's a lot of stuff in here that hasn't been built. Um, there's some issues for stuff if people want to try things and play around. This is all purely educational. Got so it. everything that we're doing with this is, is, this isn't like our cloud. Like here's our applications and how we run our classes and everything. It's just an educational infrastructure for like what a cloud and what microservices and what all of that stuff looks like. I, I'm assuming you want me to run this locally? I want you to clone it. Yeah, and okay. run it locally. You can't run the, we're not going to run the whole thing. Um, we're going to run like just service by service. So if you look at this, you can see it's actually a collection of different services. Mm -hmm. so that's what all these folders are. And we're going to navigate to those individually just for the learning part. Like we could, I took it out of here before I did this because I knew I was going to be sharing this, but we could use something like PM2 or Nginx or Docker to like spin up all of these services for us. Right. You know, now you're getting into DevOps a little bit yep. because we're developers. I kind of want to run them one at a time so we can physically see what's happening. So we can see like, oh, there's a service running on 4001 and stuff like that. Perfect. Um, okay. Okay. So let's, the first one we want to run is the account service. So navigate to uh, service dash accounts. Okay. And let's do an NPM install. Boy, after, uh, I, I don't know if you had a chance to catch Sarah Drasner on the show earlier this week, but the, the chat like just bombed us with sound effects. <laughs> Oh, yeah. There's just been like crickets in here today. I don't know where you're at, chat. I'm going to regret saying that. Um, oh. <laughs> okay, so I've got it installed. Let's start it. NPM start. Oh, wait, you know what? I forgot to mention that this requires Mongo. I think this is, do you have a, do you have a default Mongo instance set up? Great question. I don't know. Because unfortunately, yeah, I have in the issues to remove all databases so that we don't have to make sure people set up Mongo. But if not, we could set it up real quick. Nice. Um, I don't think. So it hasn't started. Let's do. Uh, do you have Brew? Yeah, I do. Can you do? Can we take a look at Brew Services? So Brew Services list. Uh. Oh. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, we'll move this. Whoops. Okay. Move this up a bit since the chat seems to want to uh, bury us in boobs. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so brew services list. It doesn't look like you have Mongo there. Okay. Yeah. So what is it? Brew install. I can't remember how to install a brew install a MongoDB. Should work. Oh, yeah, it's going to do the update off. homebrew. Oh no. Well, this will take a second. This is a this is a good place to chat about why I don't really use databases as much in classes because I would actually prefer everybody just to be able to start this. <laughs> without taking this step to make sure that you have Mongo. But um, originally when I designed this, what I was trying to demonstrate is, look, the accounts is using Mongo and the review service is using Redis because this team likes that. And, you know, this team has used their own little funky database. And like, that's the real idea behind microservices. You're not, you as your team get to decide what you're going to use. Show me and stuff. potato salad. So they all have like, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, that, that's, you know, Chat's helping. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so but but I'm I'm with you on that. Like the, the the database, like running databases locally is one of my least favorite things. Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> We could probably um, is that is that working or did that freeze? Oh, it's it's doing its thing slowly. But well, so surely. we could go ahead and take the next step, though. We can go into the next service while we wait for this one because we actually have to start up a couple things. Okay. So if you want to start up a new window, and now we're going to get out of the service accounts. We want to be in the root, and we're going to go to service colors. Okay, get everything installed. This one doesn't use a database. So we should be okay with this. And let's go ahead and start it. Let's do an NPM start. Yay, okay. so our color starts. So we could go ahead and while the brew is installing, we can go ahead and take a look at localhost 5001 just to see what this service does. Okay. So we've got all colors, total colors, let's look. Let's yeah, get- there's uh, a couple of things that were added. You see those queries? See that query that was added, entities? And service and stuff. Yeah. So what federation actually is, is this a technique for making your GraphQL APIs be able to talk to each other and send requests to each other. So when you create a federated Apollo server, it adds some stuff in there. It adds stuff to this, to your regular schema. Okay. So yeah, you could go ahead and list the colors. I think it might be an empty list now. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, we'll talk about that later. But look at that. See all that stuff that's been added? Entities and the service query. Um, ah, and, you know, the service query behold, and the entity. My query. bucket. <laughs> They're there so that the gateway server can communicate with this service. So this is some special Apollo magic that we're gonna that we're gonna have to make a change to sprinkle on your service. Yeah. But if you go to the schema, you'll see it too. So in the schema tab. Uh, Federation really works with directives. We're going to be using all okay. of these directives to create entities and to do things. So it's really a way of working with GraphQL, um, which means that this architecture you can create in other languages and people have. Oh. So you can actually start to implement Federation in Go uh, and Python and Java and some of those other things uh, because Apollo documents how this works very well in case you want to reproduce it. But basically you're creating GraphQL APIs that can talk to each other. Nice. Okay, right. cool. Um, so that's our color service, and we got that up and running. And one of the keys to our color service is we can get rid of, let's go out to the query and let's see if we can run it real quick. I guess we don't have any colors yet. So, so we need to be able to add colors, and we're going to need users for that. But okay. let's go back to, there's another service that we're going to need to start for this, and that's the review service. So we're, we have two awesome services here. We have an account service that manages all the accounts for any of the applications in Moon Highway. But we also have a review service that we can use to add reviews to any of the applications across all Moon Highway. Nice. And what's neat about these services is they work more like Auth0 or Stripe. If I work on the accounts team, I have no clue who's gonna be using my application. 
So I can't hard code stuff into accounts, assuming that, oh, there's going to be a word association app. I don't know if there's going to be a word association app. If developers create a word association app like we have, we want them to be able to incorporate accounts. Mm. So accounts is like a service that has a lot of clients, but the clients are developers, they're websites, right? So we're going to have accounts for the color app, but we're also going to have accounts for your application as well. And same thing with re reviews. Is the, the community edition going to be okay? I don't, I haven't used Mongo in a long time. Oh yeah. Yeah. I guess so. Or, oh uh, shoot. I wonder if we could do just a, I guess Mongo labs done, huh? So we can't do a link to that. I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, use the community edition. That should, that should work. I think that's what I have installed. Okay. This is going way faster now. I think what I had, what, so I have to turn this off, but, uh, by default homebrew will update itself every time that you run it. And so if yeah. you wait a little while between running homebrew, it like downloads the whole internet before it will run the command that you tried. Um, okay. So this should be running now. Let's Brew services list. Let's see if it's running. Cause you might have to start it. Just Mongo DB community is stopped. Yeah. So brew service or brew services start MongoDB, I think is the command or MongoDB community. Okay, and then I always just run a list again just to make sure. Started? Start it? Is it running? It says I don't know, it says started. Okay, cool. Yeah, oh yeah, there it is. I didn't see that little green there. Yeah, it seems like it'll work. So let's try to start that account service then. All right, cool. So I'm assuming that it's running on the default Mongo port and stuff, and we'll take a look at that stuff if it's not. Hey, -o. Yay! So we have the account service too. So we can go ahead and load that. So what's key is we're running on two different ports. These are two different instances. And we're dealing with microservices. One service is dedicated to accounts, and you can see that there's a create account and an authorize and mm -hmm. a me. And then the other service is dedicated to colors, the specialization of labor. So one is running on 4,000 and the other one's running on 5,003. And the reason is um, I, I'm using these ports because 5,000 are like the services that we have in our organization. And this is a really good note for security. Uh -oh. We're going to actually orchestrate these. What happened? Uh, the review service is some kind of refuse. Oh, okay. Connection. So hold on. I know what the problem is here. You need Redis <laughs> <laughs> right? because they're different teams. They like different oh, ways of okay. doing data. Like one team likes it. So you can just brew install Redis real fast. But it, uh, yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah. See, we got to get brew it install out. Redis. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then, <laughs> Oh boy. A little, my poor little computer is going to, it's gonna just explode. <laughs> it's gonna get hot. <laughs> Brew services start Redis. Yeah, and then list them. And let's see. Okay, Redis and Mongo are both running. So let's npm. What are you doing, computer? Why? Why are you like this? <laughs> oh, my computer's my computer's Yay! got it on lock right now. We're all good. Yeah, three services, right? 5,000, 5,001, 5,002. So this is the hardest part about like learning federation is you're, you got stuff in different folders. You have things running on different ports. If it's the end of the day and you're just banging away at like requests to the wrong port or something like that, mm -hmm. um, th those type of mistakes can happen. And it's not like a real mistake. You're just not like on the right thing because now we have different services running. That's the type of stuff you have to keep in your head. Mm -hmm. But typically when you're working under this architect architecture, oh, you and your team are really responsible on, little for computer. one service. Uh, yes. So, all right. So now we have each of these is running. We've got our free association. This is the one we built. We've yeah. got the, um, the colors, which is an uh -huh. empty table. We've got the users, which is an empty table. And we've got, uh, this one over here, which was the reviews. Yeah. Uh, which we'll is also going to be yeah. empty. We'll talk about that one later, but it needs to run so I can demonstrate the colors. Perfect. So the next thing we need, so we have all these services, your organization has all these services and it's time to expose these services to the world. And what you need to do that is a gateway. So our, okay. an Apollo gateway is an orchestration layer. And from a security perspective, all of the services that I'm running on 5,000, you would make sure no one from the outside can hit those services, right? The only thing you want publicly facing is your gateway. Everything 
else is internal. So, so long as the gateway can communicate with the services, you're fine. And then mm -hmm. you get that added security. If you have all of your services exposed, you could end up um, with security issues, especially because we have an account service and stuff like that here. Right. Uh, so everything I have on five should be secured. So we're going to create a gateway on port 4,000. And okay. what I want you to do is um, go ahead and go to the hue review gateway. So this color application is called the hue review. And the main API for it is the hue review. Hue, UI yeah. hue, hue review. Yeah. Hue review gateway. Where Not the UI. The UI yeah, oh, is uh, gateway. Yeah. Gateway hue review. Got it. Okay. Uh, NPM install. Yeah. Do you want me to and open this no, one? There's no databases or anything here. So, so the gateway is just going to orchestrate all of these services. So okay. if you go ahead and run NPM start, now you've started another service. Okay. Yay. And it's the gateway. So that's running on 4,000, right? Yes. So this is the main thing. This is where your UI would communicate. This is all of the services orchestrated together. Um, so you could get rid of those panels. Those were for the last thing that you had running on 4,000, I believe. Oh. <laughs> and okay. what we want to do. So now I just want to walk us through the process of adding a color and then talk about what's happening. Yes. So in this service, now you see that we have all those other services set up. When you open the schema and the types, you'll notice that everything has been put together. So it's grabbing all of the types from the underlying services and combining them. So the query me comes from the account service. Mm -hmm. Total reviews comes from the review service, right? The colors comes from the color service. But all of those things are now combined into one schema as if they're the monolith, even though they live in their own separate locations. So that's really key to what's going on here. So yeah. that means that we have that account functionality built into this Hue Review site. Holy buckets, and it's built into this Hue Review site. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so what I want you to do is run a create account mutation. Okay. So let's go mutation, create account, and it wants an input. And my input is email. It could be a fake one or yours or whatever. I uh, need a doctor. name. And I needed a password. Something that's easy so we can log you. I probably it. should not do. <laughs> okay. I always type do. bad password. <laughs> <laughs> we know it's bad. If you just type password, we all know if that's bad or not. <laughs> okay. And then that gives me back a token. Yeah, take the token. And if you want, you can get information about yourself back too. So that's an object. You'd have to select like your name or whatever. All right, let's get the created, right? Okay, so yeah, then I'm going to collapse it. this. We'll run it. Yeah. I have a user. All right, so grab that token. Got it. All right, and then let's go ahead and open up a new tab. And um, we'll add that token to our HTTP headers. Those are down here. Yeah. And, and you just create an authorization header. And is this like a bearer kind of thing? Yeah, yeah, just bearer and then the token. Okay. Great. So, what so are now you... you're identified. So we're using the account service, right? The account service, that's its job. They create an account, you get a token, you can log in with that token, so we can identify you. So to test that, we're going to send a me query. There we go. And then if there I take this are. out, that's you. That's you. Let's go ahead and post a color now. Nothing. Huh? So oh, yeah. yeah. There. Yeah. Good, yeah. Good so example. I took the authorization out identified. to show that it, like, that's what <laughs> makes it work. <laughs> well, check this out. Let's actually stay here for a second because there's something okay. I want to show. In the right bottom right hand corner of your screen, you're going to notice a query plan. So you can go ahead and open that up. Oh shoot! It didn't work here. Can you hit play again? Sometimes. Sometimes the query plan doesn't work. And I either need, let's go back out to the first tab that you were on. Or no, let's actually, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to be moving so fast. My head is full of coffee right now. And I'm like, oh no, do this. No, do this. No, do this. <laughs> um, well, let's, we're going to not worry about that. We're going to try to get the query plan to show up on the next screen. Let's go ahead okay. and do another tab. Where we'll uh, actually this tab. Add a color. Yeah. And this one, I want you to post a color. I think the mutation is called add colors or add color. There we go. And I just pick like any, is it a hex value? The title is just the name of the color, like 
rad red or pink or like you know like rad whatever red. you want to call it. it just gives you yeah and then a value is the hex value okay so a rad red is it a do i include the the hashtag uh yeah pound f zero zero or ff zero zero i think any web color will work um cool let's do it and we're actually we're on the graphql side so we'll never actually see these colors oh. <laughs> okay i've created rad red all right let's create another one for the fun of it but okay um rgb okay so now we've right. created red and purple let's open another tab and let's do an all colors query and then let's just get their title to start there we go so there are your colors right now you can do now right here let's see if the query plan works go ahead and open up that query plan panel Oh, why doesn't the query plan work? I've seen this, like, I see this happen sometimes and I like open up the query plan, leave that panel open and just hit refresh for me. See if we can't just do a whole refresh and then hit play and see if it, is that, is it doing something? I don't know. It was like it, it, looks, it started. It like it oh, there tried. it is. That's tracing. Yay. So, right. That thing's a little. I don't know why you have to like sometimes shock that thing to life. But what's happening is, is it's showing that you're asking for colors, but colors aren't hosted on this. This is the gateway layer. You're going to 4,000. So in order to get the colors, what the gateway does is it sends a fetch request to the colors service. That's the service that we started that's running on 5,000. And then notice as you ask for all colors, right? You see the title, go ahead and ask for the value of the color. And then what I want you to also ask for is go ahead and ask for posted by. So hit enter and do posted by or create it by. And then that's the subfield. So this is how we link to the account service. So instead of asking for name, what I want you to actually do is ask for email. Okay. Ask for the email right now. So what happens when we work with federation is references to users are saved by one field by an ID. And that ID can be used in the other service to look up the full details for that user. Oh. So if you notice when we send this and we fetch, we only, we're only sending a fetch to colors. See, only one fetch has occurred yeah. because the color service actually saves the email address that you used when you added it. It actually saves that field. We have that in that service, but now go ahead and add your name and create it over there. And created. Yeah, why not? The date created or whatever. Got it. Right? So now look at what's happening. If you look at the query plan, you're getting all that information. And that information is coming from two services. So one service has the information about the colors along with your email address for every color you added or your unique identifier. And the second service that we have to hit has the information about the users. This query plan is telling you exactly what the... Um, gateway is doing. So in order to do this, it must first make a qu request to get the colors. And then as it goes through and it makes that colors request, it sees that you're asking for more information from another service. So mm -hmm. in sequence, right, not in parallel, in sequence, it has to make a request now for the other information that you asked for from the user service. Right. So you can see it doing that, right? We have your email. And if you scroll down, we're actually trying to get, uh, the name and create it from that service. So the query plan will tell you how this whole thing orchestrates everything together, but you don't, right? You need to know this is a developer federation to a user who's using this API. It looks just like GraphQL. It doesn't, nice. really, it doesn't really matter. You would think that this is a monolith. Yeah. So just time so, checking. We've got about, about 10 minutes left. Um, so, so I think we can do it. I think yeah, we can let's do, do it, it in that time. Let's, let's try. We're going to try to move fast here. So I want you to do one other thing though, just in case we can't. Okay. Because if we can't, we still have this moon highway cloud that people can start and play with and see if they have the thing. Uh, let's go over to the me query here. Yeah. And under the me query, you should be able to see your post-it colors. So if you hit enter and look for another field, Right, so now you can get the title of all the colors that you posted. So now it's orchestrating it from the other way. We're actually starting with a query about you from the user service, and then we're seeing the information about all of the colors you posted from a yeah. completely separate service. That's super cool. So, so let's try this 10 minutes on a hustle. 
Let me ask you and let me ask everybody, do we want to try to add your service to this in 10 minutes? Or do we want to look under the hood of these services and see how they work? Chat, what do you think? You want to build one or do you want to review one that's already built? They want to see under the hood. They want to see. Under oh, the wait, hood. we've got build, build, build. I think oh, we can do it. <laughs> it's like a dead heat here. Uh, we're we going to see under the hood risky. if we build it, right? Huh? Yeah. If we build it, you're going to see let's, it. Let's let's do it. Let's if speed we start run. Start debugging stuff. It's not. We probably won't be able to do it. But let's let's give it a shot. So go to your service that you have running now. Got it. Here. All right. And so, All right, the, so what you want to do is you're going to stop this service. Oh, so we would and you're going code. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. So my service is at which my 5,000. This is the problem. This is the confusing stuff, right? <laughs> service accounts. Here's my service. 4,003. Okay, cool. Okay. So let's go ahead and stop this and let's install at Apollo slash Federation. Okay. All right, so what I want you to do is now go, so now we're using Apollo Federation. We have that package. I want you to go into your index.js file and we need to import it. So I want you to import or const. So destructure, and we're gonna pull this argument out, is called build federated schema, camel case. So capital F, yeah, and capital. And then you're gonna oh require that from the uh, Apollo Federation. Okay. All right, sweet. And then let's go ahead and we're going to go down to where we start the server. And down in here, so instead of what you're going to do for type depths and resolvers here is right where they are, go ahead and add a schema colon. And then we're going to invoke build federated schema. That's a function. And do I pass the type depths and resolvers into it? Uh, as a, we want to do that as an array. So yeah, we want to do an array type. Okay. And then hit enter, and we're also going to add an object. And then the object resolvers and type depths. Okay. There you go. Got it. And now on our server, yeah, so that should work. Schema equals, so I think that should work. I don't think I'm missing anything. What I want you to do is try and start it. Here we go. Save all your saves and see if it starts. And what does it say? Cannot read property kind of undefined. Do I need to add a directive or something to the schema? Oh wait, I, I think uh, I might have had that extra stuff in here that we didn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Resolve. Get that stuff. That's what it is, probably. Okay. Yeah. All right. So let's Get try this again. Let's try this again. No, what don't you like? Oh man, this is what I was worried Known about. Known directives. We don't have any directives in there though. Hmm. Let me look at something real quick. I didn't That's add, good. I didn't add a user or anything, did I? No, we don't I don't see that anywhere. Free association. We don't have any comments or anything. Just for the fun of it, just to a, a, amuse me, because sometimes Federation's funny with stuff. Get rid of that comma between word and association. It should work, but I'm just I just and then we'll go over there. Let me see if I, let me check something else real quick. Oh, we got to move fast because. I know. <laughs> uh, let's just see if they change that syntax real quick. Um, okay, so what we're trying to do here is we're trying to sprinkle all of that feder good federation stuff mm -hmm. on top of our schema. Um, and so it's basically, those are supposed to be the two lines of code that we're supposed to add, but obviously we have something missing. So I just want to check one thing and then I will we'll move over to showing how that works. Uh, Got a, an issue link here in the not read property kind of undefined. I'm worried that they changed the way that they did it. Schema build federated schema. No, that looks good. Yeah, that's all right. That's what we got. Oh, we got to use the GQL parser thing. 
Ooh, it's okay. We can do that gotcha. really fast. Yeah, so go ahead and add that. Yeah, and then surround your type defs with GQL. Uh, you could probably do it. Yeah, or oh, that does that works right there. GQL and then whatever your type defs are. Cool. So we're okay, gonna do cool. this real fast. We're gonna get this out of there, and now it's gonna just work, I believe. Come on, let's do it. Look at it go. Yay! So open it up real quick. All right, so our server is here, 4003, and okay. if we look at the docs, we can see docs. service. Hey yes, we got it. All right, so that's all you need to do. If you want to use Federation, if your service is going to go behind the gateway, you have to set up a federated service. It's no different than what you've done before in creating a server. It doesn't support subscriptions. There's a workaround, but we don't have time for that. Yeah. So <laughs> let's go build a gateway real quick. I need yeah. you to start a new project really quickly. Okay. And you're going to install the at Apollo slash gate Apollo GraphQL. We'll wait till you get to the screen. Uh, let's go make yeah, their call it the gateway or whatever. Gateway. Yeah. yeah. We're just going to call it a gateway. And then install GraphQL. Apollo server. Anything else? Uh, and then at Apollo slash gateway. Okay. And then let's go ahead and go, we're in your gateway. You're going to create an index.js just like everything else. And let's open that index.js. Okay. All right. And then what you want to do is you're going to create an instance of the Apollo server. So const and then destructure Apollo server. Oh boy, I can do this. We're, we're getting there. It's Here we go. Much it's happening. It. And then we're going to do Apollo gate. Also import destructure Apollo gateway and remote GraphQL data source. Remote GraphQL data source like that. Yeah. Capital R. Is there a capital R on the remote? Nope. Yeah, let's capital R that remote. There and we go. GraphQL G is uh, is the QL capital. capital and QL is capital and D. Yeah. Okay. And the source right. S. And then that's from Apollo Gateway. Right. Okay. So also just a real quick side note, if we didn't want to build this, Apollo has managed gateways. You can actually go to the Apollo manager and, nice. and create your own gateway there without having to write the code. So now let's create a variable called gateway. And uh, it's a new Apollo gateway. So we're going to use that Apollo gateway instance to do it. Okay. And then let's go ahead and the first variable is service list. And that's an array and that's where we list our services. Okay. So an object, the first object is gonna be the name, our free association service. That's just a string and you get to call it whatever you want. Yeah. And then the URL. So whatever local host port that one's running on. Okay. And then the next object is the user service, right? So we're trying to put the user service now together with the... And that one was at, let's see, user... I think it's 5,000, what is it? 5,000. Yes, 5,000. Okay. So that's, yeah, that's our organization's user service. We never have to do that again, just by incorporating it once it's run. Yep. So now we just have to run the server now. You have the gateway. Okay. So we have to create one of those asynchronous start functions that I like to create. So a little start function so we can use some asynchronous syntax if we want. Uh, okay, so our server and is a new a Apollo. New Apollo, ser new Apollo server. And then this time in the object, you send the gateway. So send the new Apollo server your gateway and then usually set subscriptions to false. So gateway comma subscriptions false. And then that's it, subscriptions false. And then server, go ahead and server listen. Listen, and we'll put it on what four thousand. Um, four thousand is already running. Let's put it on. Uh, this is our gateway, right? So four thousand. Let's put it on four thousand three. I usually do four thousand. We for the gateway. already have four thousand three. Let's put it on four thousand four. Four thousand four. Yeah. Okay. That sounds good. Um, and then dot then, and then just say running or something like that. We don't even need to worry about the URL this time. For speed. Okay. All right, and then, and then we'll let's cross it. our fingers and run this. Async function start. Okay, I believe this is going to work on the first try. Running. Okay. Yes. okay. Local so now host. Go to the gateway. Four thousand four. 
Okay. Uh, all right. All Get all free associations and, and a user. Just combine them. So like that's like that's the step that I thought we could get to in this. <laughs> if you want to keep going, I'm glad. Look at it go going. though. You like just did it. You just like got the. You just combine them. You can query your free associations here too. So the next step, really, the next step would be to um, to to combine the user so that when you make a post, we know that you've made the post. Mm -hmm. But you don't have to worry. I know we don't have time for that. I yeah. do have resources for how to do that though. Yes. So, so I have a plan. We will add all of those in the um, in the show notes um, and we'll make sure that like so just go check out. It's on learnwithjason.dev. Uh, the episode with with Alex is going to be posted. Um, you'll be able to see all the show notes here once this episode goes live. It'll be cross posted tomorrow. Um, it'll also be in the replay notes on Twitch for as long as this replay is available on Twitch. Um, Alex, where else should people go if they want to um, if they want to follow you online. So I just put in the chat a link to a uh, egghead collection that I have on Federation. And that actually shows us what the next step is. I'd be really impressed Perfect. if you were following along and you built your own free association server, the information that you need to take the next step is here. So these videos Excellent. are short, but you saw how fast, like we talked a lot, didn't yeah. we? But you saw how fast we actually got it going once we wrote the code, because there's like so much conceptually. For sure. I'm Moon Tahoe on Twitter. Um, so not a lot of people know that because Alex Banks was already taken. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually Moon Tahoe on everything. If you're playing Switch and you see Moon Tahoe, that's that's me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> so that is unfortunately all the time we have. I feel like I could go on this all day because this is so much oh, yeah, fun. Yeah, yeah, but uh, Alex, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, everybody go follow Alex on Twitter and everywhere else. Make sure you go check out Alex and Eve's work. Um, it's it's really like best in class. Uh, with that, we're going to do one more quick shout out to the sponsors for today's show. Netlify, Sanity, Auth0, and Fauna um, for making it possible to have white coat captioning do the live captioning for us. Make sure you go check out our schedule because we've got a lot of fun stuff coming up. Um, it's going to be a, a whole lot of fun, lots of things to learn. You can add this to your calendar so that you always get notified. Um, Alex, thank you so much. Chat, hey. thank you for hanging out. Stay tuned. We're going to raid. We'll see you next time. Yeah, see you.